like we should have at least this whole time, Nat, been hearing people wanting to know about it, but it seems like it's completely off the radar. Now, accountability for Bush-era tortures. How's Obama going to do that when he's still torturing people at secret bases in Afghanistan right now as we speak? Oh, yeah, as we speak, they're at the Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan, where we have a number of prisoners. There is what they call in the torture trade the other prison, also at Bagram. And that, according to the few people who have somehow managed to get out, that's like the old-fashioned CIA black sites that do doing torture. And nobody seems to care. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Larissa Alexandrovna at Raw Story uh, showed that the torture prison in Poland was actually used to be a Soviet base, and before that was a Nazi base. And then the Americans used it as a, a safe house to torture people there. Now, isn't it interesting in a kind of sad sense? So many vital issues are, are involved in the midterms coming up next week. I have not heard anybody on any side mention torture. It's as if it's now they've conditioned the, the large majority of Americans. It's just, it, they, it happens. So you figure, okay, okay, let's get on to something more important. That is important. Let's get on to jobs. Let's get on to Obamacare. Meanwhile, we keep torturing people. Right, yeah, it's uh, outrage overload. There's too many things to be mad about. Hey, we still never got to prosecute Douglas Fife for manufacturing the case that Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden were friends. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I, I, you want to talk about grievances. Let's go back to Bill Clinton's mass murder of Iraqis uh, through the blockade, his uh, cover-up of the truth of who else was in on the Oklahoma bombing, his use of the Delta Force against the Branch Davidians at Waco in 1993. There's some trials. And then, well, geez, you're 85. I guess you, I guess you probably have some going back a ways, huh? Now, also, Bill Clinton, and this was the, the, the kicker, he knew about Rwanda because we had a guy there who cared about it. And information was coming as the forces that were going to do the, the genocide were preparing themselves. And he gave instructions to the State Department to not mention anything that had the word genocide in it. And it all went along. And even Mary uh, Albright, was, who was our U.N. representative, uh, delayed any kind of U.N. action on it. And then it happened. And then, this is the chutzpah of all time, after the, the rivers literally were running with blood, Clinton arrives in the capital city of Rwanda and says how terrible he feels that, if, that this went on if he and other leaders had only known about it, it wouldn't have. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess he was in sort of in the same position as Barack Obama. How can he prosecute for uh, genocide when he's committing it? Just like, uh, you know, in his case in Iraq, and, and the same thing with Barack Obama still torturing people. Um, I'm looking at the other Scott Horton's blog, um, the heroic anti-torture human rights attorney writes for Harper's Magazine there. Yeah, right. And, right. and uh, he's been talking about how the Army Field Manual, Appendix M, still allows... Uh, all kinds of uh, oh, yeah. sleep I've, deprivation I've, I've, I've and cold water. I've written about that. You mm -hmm. know, I used to think, oh, well, if we only had the Army field manual, not only for the Army, but from all these, for example, these special forces, they do a lot of very evil things. Yeah, well, they rewrote the field manual when, when John but McCain... But I saw the new so-called revised field manual, I would hate to be in a prison where that was okay. Yeah, well, and that's what's happening to these people, as you say. There's the... The Bagram Prison, and then there's the wink, wink, Bagram Prison, the real one. Yeah. Room 101, your greatest fear. So I wonder, you know, there's so much that is known that doesn't have to be even broken as a story, but it goes on and on and on, and people get distracted by other things. And uh, no wonder the president, this president, says he doesn't want to look backwards, he wants to look forward. And, of course, that's the best way to avoid being punished for whatever crimes against, well, war crimes. That's what they are in our own laws and our international covenants. This right. goes on and on and on, and it's not an issue in this campaign. Yeah, well, you know, I think that 
I like to believe, at least now, that more and more people get it. And part of what they get is that politics isn't the answer anyway. It's a withdrawal of consent, a withdrawal of the assumption of legitimacy for this government in general, that the American people have got to get through their head. That's what we'll bring an end to this, is when no one cares to choose between a Republican or a Democrat anymore. They just refuse to go along anymore. Well, that's why, for example, the Tea Partiers, they did a good service. They got a lot of people aware of what was going on with Obamacare in terms of people's actual lives. But I've been writing about I wish they had... I know that, you know, somebody said recently, and it's true, somebody, a Tea Party guy said, we're not uh, organized, we're just decentralized. But you still have a forum, and a lot of people listen to you. They're not so hip to civil liberties either. That's not one of their main things. They read the Constitution, but where do they talk about the separation of powers, not only on health care, but on torture? Right. Well, and that's the whole thing, though, too. And, you know, I guess it's funny. I'm an anarchist now, and I have been for a while. But when I was a kid, I was mostly a constitutionalist, and mostly because I thought, you know, yeah, but what are you going to do? It's uh, it's not perfect, but at least the people of the country think that they believe in the Constitution. They know. I remember a poll years and years ago, to me anyway, that said 91% of the American people believe that the Constitution is important to them, and particularly the Bill of Rights is important to them. And that doesn't mean that they necessarily understand it or that they choose right based on those principles. But I always thought, Nat, that we could just say, hey, look, you know, uh, piccolos and, and drums and the Declaration of Independence and the 4th of July, and these are the things that we believe in, basically. Everybody can believe in whatever religion they want. They can go where they want. They can own their own business, their own property. Yeah. They have the right to not be searched unless a judge says it's okay first based on a real sworn statement that is punishable if it's a lie, uh, that you get a fair trial even if they accuse you of the very worst crime. These are the these are the things that we all believe, right? It's, no, that's you the know. problem. That's the problem. You know, one of my main crusades for years has been so that kids coming up can understand why they're Americans. And very, very few schools teach anything about the Constitution. Tell the st You know, when I used to go around to schools around the country, I would simply tell them stories. You know why we have a Fourth Amendment? You know what the British did to the colonists? when they wrote their own warrants and came into their homes and offices, well, that's why we got the Fourth Amendment. Do you know what's in it? You get blank stares. You get blank stares now. Yeah. And we don't have it anymore, so to speak. <laughs> but you know what? At the same time, there really is a lot of reason to be optimistic because, um, you know, even though people are bent out of shape sometimes about the wrong things and pointing their fingers the wrong way, uh, at least they're mad. And, you know, I think that um, – I think more and more not, people are understanding that empire abroad means the end of the republic at home, that we just can't have it both ways, and that if we want to have our constitution, that doesn't just mean uh, separation of church and state. It also means gun rights too, and the gun rights people got to understand. It means separation of church and state too, that all of us have got to get together on just the few basic things like peace – and passing on the Bill of Rights to the young ones, right? These are the most important things. I tell you, I wish you were running for Congress. No, I, no, I, no, I that'd be the worst thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that'd be absolutely horrible. I'd never do that, I promise. But No, but we need people in there who can do some of this. You know, I was a big fan of on, on civil liberties with Russ Feingold. But here he comes and says, oh, we got to have this Obamacare. He may get beaten finally. That means... Whoever takes his place is not going to be as passionate as he was about about the Constitution. Yeah. Well, now, you're you know, right, though. You can't give up. That's why the two of us are, are do do what we, what we do, but it sometimes looks pretty dreary. Yeah. Well, you know, the first time I ever met Ron Paul was in 2004, and... Um, uh, Karen Katowski, who I'm sure you're aware of, she was the one who witnessed the neocons lying us into war from the Pentagon back in 2002 and 2003. Yeah. And, and I asked her, well, what would you ask Ron Paul? We're all at the Libertarian Party convention. And she said, well, I would ask him, what are we even doing here when there's only one Ron Paul? Uh, you know, Russ Feingold ain't it. There's really only one Ron. And what are we supposed to do when there's only one? Why even bother kind of thing? 
And so I did ask him that. And his answer to me was that, hey, a few years ago, we assumed that the Soviet Union would last at least, you know, generations into the future. And, and then the whole world changed. And so our job is not to predict the future and, and predict the worst, but to just keep teaching about liberty and and we'll see what happens. We're witnesses to it like everybody else. And then, of course, we've seen what happened in practice with him following that exact same strategy. Just keep teaching people about liberty and uh, and see how it goes. And, you know, when he started last time in 2007, a lot of people never heard of him before. Hardcore libertarians all across the country knew all about him and had a, he, we were his cult following, I guess, in a way. But by the end of the thing, he was famous Is enough uh for that's where he should have started <laughs> and, and it could have been a different story maybe and it, it seems to me not that um you know he would be the oldest president to take office in american history and and you know obviously the military industrial complex and the bankers and the tv people aren't going to want it but it seems to me like here's this honest man no matter what you agree with or or not about all of his policies he's an honest guy and he's basically saying all right one last chance peace and liberty and the bill of rights and the constitution on a silver platter you can have a republic or an empire here it is are you going to take it or not and i think that the the people on the left and the people on the right and the people who don't identify with either of those things or never did that that really agree with that that peace and the bill of rights are what matters I'll i think you, maybe you, we could have one last chance and actually take it i think what i'm seeing is that more and more people they're not huge in numbers yet they may not call themselves libertarians they may not even know what that means but they're coming to that kind of understanding that to be an American citizen and to have that mean anything, you have to have an understanding of freedom all the way through as the individual gets his freedom or her freedom. And it's not a grant from the government. They work for us. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the real bottom line is, and one time I got in a fight in the email with a fan of the show years and years ago, where he was trying to get me to come up with the word. For some reason, he was just beating me over the head because I didn't understand what he was getting at, but I'm glad he made such a big deal about it because it's really easy. It's right in front of us. It's accountability. That's what we want is for the law to apply to everybody equally. If it has to apply to us, it ought to at least apply to them a little bit or something, and, and we see... Wars based on lies undeclared by our Congress. We see the Bill of Rights shredded. We see trillions of dollars created out of thin air by these central bankers and given to their friends who are already the most rich and powerful people yeah, in the world, right. the biggest heist ever going on. And what we want, Nat, is accountability for these people. That's how we can keep our liberty is really kind of what you were talking about more specifically a few minutes ago, which is prosecutions for torturers, for example. No, there is a law, and torturers will go to prison for torturing people. That's how it's supposed to be well we have to keep on keeping on we're gonna try well listen i really appreciate all your work along these lines and and all your wisdom from your point of view um you're it's always a, a great contribution also, to this show and it's also like an obamacare it's in self-defense as, right. uh, as somebody my age i can't vote for anybody who's for obamacare <laughs> Well, yeah, clearly understood. And people, uh, I urge you, if especially if you tend to be liberal or democratic and oppose the wars and, and don't usually see things my way on economic issues and that kind of thing, you should, uh, if you're not too familiar, you should become familiar with uh, Nat Hentoff and his background and who he is because uh, I wouldn't want you to kind of uh, uh, characterize him in a way where, like, Matto would have you believe uh, about somebody who's against Obamacare, that it's all based on some kind of, um, you know, ridiculous Obama's a Muslim kind of Palin-esque nonsense, because that's Listen, certainly I, not where Mr. Hentoff is coming from. So I, I just want to try to set that care, context I clear. I wouldn't care if Obama was a atheist like I am, a pro-life atheist. That would be okay, but not if he puts in Obamacare. All right. Well, that's a good place to leave it, is to highlight the importance of that issue. So uh, thank you for your work on all these issues, and thanks for your time on the show today, Nat. Well, thank you for continuing the fight. Everybody, that's Nat Hentoff. He's at the Cato Institute, and he's got this piece. Oh, my Mozilla froze up, but it's to prison anyway after acquittal at the Trentonian. I believe it's thetrentonian.org.